And so, question eight then. Ha <laughs> from paper two of the 2015 new hire. The one that came in for a bit of criticism. As well as the one with the toad and the frog, presumably. Because even though it was an entirely respectable question, entirely expected type of question, it was this part here that really came in for the ridicule. Especially this diagram. It's a very poor diagram, very comical diagram, and misleading as well in the sense that that vertical line looks like a vertical pole on the crocodile's side, so the 20 metres goes diagonally across the river. It'd be better if they just stuck with a simple plan view like this, an idealised diagram. It was all in the sake, I suppose, of trying to create something which was relevant to real life. Matter of fact, this modelling has got nothing to do with the real life situation which would take place between these two animals. But anyway, apart from that, it was a standard optimization question. Usually they're in two parts though. The first part would be derive this equation here, and then the second part would be optimize it. But here they just gave you it to begin with. You could have derived it for yourself because quite clearly those are the two parts of this journey here. Part across the water and part across the land. 20 minus x is the distance in the land, and this expression must be the distance in the water, and it is, because there's a right-angle triangle, so this must have been 6. 6 squared and x squared would give you this one here. And then those must be the times that it takes, but not the speed, but the time it would take to travel a certain distance, the time per metre. And it says, and this is you have to be careful, it says that that's in tenths of a second. So it takes five tenths of a second to cover one metre in water, but what, four tenths of a second to cover it on land? And the first part does say, so what is the time that it takes? So A part one, calculate the time taken if the crocodile does not travel on land. And that's not meant to be cryptic. That's simply meant to say if they don't travel on land, then X would have to be all of 20. So for part A, you're just working out the value at 20. So that will be five times the square root of 36 plus 20 squared, plus four times 20 minus 20, just to put the substitution in, although there's only one mark for this answer. So that's 436, that's looking a little bit nasty. 436, but at least that comes to zero. Now that isn't a perfect square, nor does it go down to a simple little sod, you know, like a two or a three, which might be okay as an answer. The best you could do with that is to take four out of it, leaving 109, and four out of it, would make it a 2, so it would be 10 root 109, which isn't really a satisfactory answer at all, especially when you consider the units are tenths of a second. So you wouldn't say, how long did it take to travel? It took 10 root 109 tenths of a second. Well, 10 root 109 is 104.403, etc. Tenths of a second. It's just taken quite a bit for its first mark. So putting it into a reasonable unit, as in seconds, that would be 10.4 seconds. That should have been the mark. Well, that took quite a bit of working. And in fact, if you look at the marking scheme, obviously they were in a panic trying to allocate marks. And no matter whether you wrote 10.4 or 104, whether you mentioned seconds or no seconds, or whether you left it as 10 root 109, or whether you even left it as this, with no mention of units, you got your mark. I think it would be reasonable, just like in higher physics or anywhere else, to express it in a reasonable unit, in a reasonable way. So what was the second bit? So the second bit would be, calculate the time if the crocodile swims the shortest distance possible. That would be straight across. So the point P would be here and X would be zero. You're looking for T of zero. At least that should be a nice little answer, because that would just be 5 root 36 plus 0 squared, plus 4 times 20 minus 0. So root 36 is 6, and 5 sixes are 30. 4 twenties are 80, and that gives you 110 tenths of a second. So that would be 11 seconds. So that would be the second mark. But again, they were allocating that mark whether you drew 11 or 110, whether you mentioned seconds or not. Part B then. Between these two extremes, there they are there, 
There is one value of x which minimises the time taken. Find this value of x and hence calculate the minimum possible time. 8 marks. Now notice this is finding the value of a function in an interval. You're not just going to differentiate this, get a value of x, and then consider that in isolation. If that was the case, you'd have to determine whether that value of x was a maximum or a minimum, because there's nothing to compare it to. This is finding the value in an interval. In other words, at 0 and 20, you've got certain values. Obviously not that way around, because the 0 is meant to be higher. And the only way that those wouldn't be the highest and lowest would be if there was a stationary value in between, because otherwise it would be continuously increasing or decreasing. You're finding the value of a function in an interval, so you don't need to justify the nature of the stationary point, only discover if there in fact is one. So, differentiate it, but first get it into a suitable form. So t of x is going to be 5, and I'll just rewrite that in index form. Maybe with this one here, at the same time, I'll just multiply it out. 80 minus 4x. That gets you a mark for putting it in index form. That's OK. Then start to differentiate. Now, there's quite a few marks for differentiating, in fact. There's three marks for the differentiation if you include the equating to 0, which seems to have been tagged on to the end. Because the first mark just comes from how to deal with a function of a function, the chain rule. There's one mark for dealing with the outside, one mark for dealing with the inside. Outside first, power a half, multiply by the power, so that's a divide by two, and take one off the power, so that'll be negative a half. That was worth a mark. And then the inside function, knowing to multiply by the derivative of that, which was 2x, that was a mark. No, there wasn't a mark for doing this part here, which is just minus four. The next mark came when you tidied that up and equated it to zero. So tidying that up, what have we got? Because that will come to the front, the twos will cancel. That'll be 5x. I could write it over just now, but I'll just leave it. 36 plus x squared to the negative a half minus four. That's still not the mark. The mark comes now when you say, well, I'm going to want to find if there's any stationary points, any stationary values, maybe I should say. Well, that will happen if the derivative is equal to zero. Now, that's the finish off and equate to zero was the fourth mark. That's not bad. So, this thing here should equal zero, which means, and I think I'll write this back the way it is, which is 5 over the square root of 36 plus x squared minus 4 should equal 0. Save a line and put equals 4. That's a mark for starting to solve it. Now, you need to get rid of a square root and you need to get rid of a denominator. You can do that in either order. You can either square this side, square both sides first, or you can take that across and multiply and then square. I think I'll take it across first, just to save some space. So 5x will be 4 root 36 plus x squared if you like, taking it across and multiplying, or multiplying both sides by this. Now squaring both sides, 25x squared will be 16 times, and of course the square root will just revert to its content. That would be a nasty multiplication. I've got 16x squared to take away from this, that's going to leave me with 9x squared, but I've got 16 times 36, well you could just use your calculator, 2 times 8, Double it, 72, 8 times 72, 56 and a 12, 5, 7, 6. So that x squared would be that divided by 9. So that would be the 64. And then finally, x is going to be the square root, which is 8. And of course, positive 8 only, because x is a positive number. x is greater than 0. Now, amongst here... The critical mark was how to deal with the square root, knowing to square both sides, and then finally solving it. Now, there's seven marks so far. I don't think it was that bad, apart from maybe knowing how to deal with the square root there. But still, as far as the question is concerned, you have to consider when you're looking for a greatest or least value in an interval, you have to consider the endpoints and any stationary points. So still to justify what this is, not with a table of signs, but justify it by what it actually gives us an answer. So I still need to work out what t of 8 comes to. And then you compare it to those. So that would be 5 root 
36 plus, I'll just jump in with 64, that's quite handy, because that just makes that 100, plus 4 times 20 minus 8, so that's 100, so that's 10, so that's 50, that's 12, that's 48, so that makes that 98, but again that was tenths of a second, so the answer to that would be 9.8 seconds. And that's the final mark. And in the marking scheme, there's no mark for actually justifying that by stating that, which you normally would, that that's the minimum because it's the lowest out of the three. Maybe if you didn't know about the marking scheme, you'd have had to justify that by saying, well, T8 was less than T20, which was less than T0, in which case T8 is the minimum. There's one little thing about the answer, even though it says either of them is acceptable and units don't matter. The only consistency they want is, if in part A you just wrote down the number of tenths of a second without mentioning, mentioning units, then in part B here you'd also have to use the same one. You can switch to the opposite one, and of course vice versa.